All right, so let's uh, open God's Word to Philippians, all right? The book of Philippians, we've been going through this book, and uh, if you're new with us here, this is what we do every Sunday morning. We'll open up the Word of God because, like I always say, it's not worth getting up in the morning and come hear me talk, but what we do is we open the Word and say, look, this is what God has said, and look at it together and how we can apply this in our lives. So we're in Philippians chapter 4, and the topic this morning is contentment. We find Paul in this letter talking about contentment. Now, this is kind of strange because uh, if you've been with us, remember Paul's in jail. And this church, he's writing a thank you letter back to a church in the city of Philippi, thus Philippians, okay? A city in Philippi that had a heart for him and sent him like a care package. Uh, He was in prison and they didn't provide a whole lot. Uh, in prison in those days, and so they provided this care package. He's writing his thank you note back to them, but in doing so, he says so much about life, and he speaks out of his circumstance, and uh, which is kind of crazy because he's going to talk about contentment. Funny hearing from a guy who's in jail about contentment. Funny hearing the topic contentment from a guy who someone has said the only stocks and bonds Paul ever knew were around his wrists and his, his ankles. And so, wow, how, how in the world could he know contentment? Well, let's find out, all right? So Philippians chapter 4, and this morning we'll just look at these uh, five verses here, beginning verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but had no opportunity to show it. Now, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content. Whatever the circumstances, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well-fed, anybody well-fed this morning, or hungry. You know, a few more hands will go up if the sermon goes too long or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. It was good for you to share in my troubles. I want to warn you, I want you to beware that they are coming after you. Now, you know some people who maybe you think everybody's always coming after them, but but these, these this is true, they're coming after you. Who, you say? The contentment stealers, they're coming after you. Do you realize it? They're coming after you from all kinds of angles, especially at this time of year. The marketers, the sales force, the advertising agencies, they are working for companies that want you to buy stuff. They want you to be needy. (laughs) <laughs> I want, I want, I need, I need. You know, they pay these people a lot of money, these marketers and advertisers, and they view you and I as consumers. That's what we are to them. What can we get out of them? We want them to buy our stuff. And so they're coming at you from any way, shape, or form you can imagine. Commercials, flyers, emails, um, it, it's hitting us all the time. And it creates in us... This thing, well, I want, no, I need, I have to have, I can't live without, you will be happier when, if I have this, I'll finally get girls. You know, it's like, what? I mean, that's, that's what all these, have you ever noticed that? All these commercials uh, push on us. I was in a preaching uh, seminar a few years ago, and a guy uh, that was teaching it, leading it, said, I want to show you how the culture has changed and, and, and how things have happened. And they showed a commercial, a Ford commercial from the 60s, and then they showed a Ford commercial from, like, today, all right? And so it was hilarious because here's the Ford motor commercial in the 60s. Guy pulls into the gas station. You know, out comes the gas station attendant, right? Pumps his gas for him. Lifts the hood, checks the oil, and then comes up to the guy and begins to tell him, my, this is a fine-looking automobile you have, and starts to describe the engine. And, whoa, this has this and this and this, and the guy behind the wheel, yeah, it has this and this and this, and begins to describe all the qualities and characteristics of the car. He goes, okay, you got that? We got it. Now he showed us a commercial from today. 
here's this, you know, sharp-looking guy, this studly guy, and this good-looking woman. They're, they're driving along the ocean, you know, swirling, hair flying in the breeze, you know. And, and then and it switches to nighttime, and they're with their friends going through the city. And they never said a word about the car. Not a word about anything related to the car, except for the end. Buy this car. Buy this Ford. You know, it's such an interesting change of events. Do you realize that that's happening? Have you ever watched a commercial? So, so, you know, you get done watching that car commercial and think, man, I'd like a girl like that. I'd like to drive. I, you know, how do I get one of those girls? Buy the car. You know? That's what it does in us. Hey, have you ever been watching a commercial? This happened uh, a week ago. A commercial started on the TV, and I thought, this is fascinating. And I said to Holly right away, I said, what are they selling? What are they selling? What's this a commercial for? Because so many times, commercials will string along, and it has nothing to do with the product they're going to sell at the end. Do you realize what they're doing? They are just stirring in you desire. They are doing whatever they can to stir desire in you, need in you. I want, I want, I want. And then the product comes in. The product might not be able to meet this need they stirred up at all, you know? But it's, it's, it's what's happening to it. Do you realize that they're coming after us? Now, this makes it very, very difficult for us who live in America because we're surrounded constantly through emails and commercials on TVs and stuff sent in the newspaper all the time. You need, you want, you can't live without you can get girls if. And so, so what? it's really, really difficult to be content. It's very difficult to be content. I wish they'd all just leave us alone, right? Someone comes up to you and, and says, uh, what do you want for Christmas? Maybe you've experienced, what do you want for Christmas? Oh, I don't know. Well, make out a list. Well, I don't know. I'm fine. I was doing fine until you asked me about a Christmas list. <laughs> and now I've got to think about all these things I want and need. And I, you know, it's just it's weird, isn't it? It's a strange thing. Uh, ben Franklin. Ben Franklin uh, said, Who is rich? He who is content. Who is that? Nobody. Nobody. And, and we recognize that in the, in the culture in which we live. It's a very rare rare thing and very difficult because you're going to have to fight against this constant stream of people coming at you uh, if you're going to know content contentment. Well, apparently Paul did, right? He speaks very openly about what he has found, his contentment and his claims about it, and he claims that you and I can know the same thing. So let's figure this out, huh? Let's check this out. Notice four points. The first one is this, is that contentment is something that you learn. Contentment is something that you learn. And you will continue to learn for the rest of your life. Contentment is something that you learn. Paul says twice here in these verses, verse 11, I have learned to be content. Verse 12, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content. Contentment is not something that comes naturally to us. It does not come naturally, especially in the culture in which we live. Uh, if you don't think that's true, watch a two- and three-year-old at Christmas time. You know, how many two- or three-year-olds you say, here's one present, they open it up, it's a ball, and they go, this is all I ever wanted, thank you. <laughs> right? They're going to say, more? Uh, how, uh, don't be shocked if there's a pile of presents and the three-year-old opens the last one and says, more? And you go, seriously? But, you know, where, where do they learn it? It's very, very difficult, right? And this, this is, as we grow up, especially in our culture, this lack of contentment keeps hanging on and it increases. In fact, it can be like a bad cold that you never get rid of and just lingers in your heart and in your spirit for the rest of your life, but you can learn contentment. Tim Hansel um, said something in a book I read in my late 20s, and it just jarred me because it was so reflective of my own heart. He said, much of the time I have the distinct feeling that my life has not yet started 
and I'm still waiting for the proper moment to begin. Being translated means, it'll be great when. How often do you live in a state of, well, it'll be great when. You know, it'll be great when I get married. It'll be great when we have kids. It'll be great when the kids leave the house. It'll be great when they're going to retire. It'll be great when, it'll be great when. Live in a perpetual state of, well, it'll be great when. He says, I, I, I can wait my whole life for the moment to begin. In the movie Chariots of Fire, uh, Harold Abrams, Abrahams is, is one of the lead, one of the characters. Uh, it's a movie about Eric Little, and these are Olympic runners. And there's a scene in the movie, and he's tormented. This, this very gifted Olympic runner is tormented. And at one point, he says this. He says, contentment. I am 24, and I have never known it. I'm forever in pursuit, and I don't even know what it is that I'm chasing. You know, and it's not when Paul says you can, he's learned to be content. It's not just a book learning. It's not like, can you give me the half hour class on contentment? You come out, take the test, there I passed. It's more than things that you learn information, knowledge, truth. There's also experience. There are things you go through, and as you go through them, you learn by experience that God meets you there with contentment. And by the way, it'll be something that you, you know, we find you continue to have to learn for a lifetime. I was with a group of men this week, and, and this came up, and it was interesting to think about because you go, you think, okay, I'm in my 20s and I found contentment. Then I hit 30s, and then I hit some. And you find yourselves in different seasons of life. You find yourselves in different circumstances in life. And it's almost like hitting the next level of a video game you can feel like I'm learning contentment all over again. That's right. Don't be shocked by it. Don't, don't act like, gee whiz, I've never been content. No, but our life changes, circumstances change, and we have to continue to learn to be content. A man stopped me uh, in between services this morning. He's gone through some changes in his life. And he says, you know, I used to be content. And now I'm not. I'm fighting with it again. And I, I said, that's right, you're, you've entered a, another season. And God will help you learn. We need to learn to be content. And Paul had been through a variety of seasons. What was unique about his life, he was older when he writes this. He'd been all through all kinds of experiences. And drastic extremes. You know, very few people, you know, sometimes you'll run into folks who go, you know, I've known poverty, I grew up with nothing, and now I have a lot. Um, but, but a, a lot, you know, that's more unusual. But Paul, he was all over the map with his life experiences, what he, what he enjoyed and didn't enjoy. And in fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he kind of goes through a little bit of a, a, a recap of his life. Listen to his life, and this is out of which he speaks. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Let that sink in. Five times. I've often wondered what a scarred, mutilated mess Paul's back of his head and shoulders and back and back of his legs must have looked like. To go through that five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Now that means you got rocks thrown at you. He goes, once stoned, man. I've been a lot more than that. <laughs> Three times I was shipwrecked. Three times I was shipwrecked. You know, what if you got on a plane with a guy? And looked at, how's it going? Good. You fly much? Yeah. I went down three times. You're going to go, whoa, I'm getting off this plane. I'm signing up for the next flight. Uh, this guy's shipwrecked three times. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea. He can't get anywhere. Danger from false brothers. I go to church and I'm in danger. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep, often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst. 
and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. And out of that life and those experiences, Paul says, hey, I've learned to be content. You know, part of what this learning involves is learning that enough is enough. Enough is enough. You know, more, more, more. I want more, 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 more. You know, what, this is a question that will often come up with people, or often, not often enough, maybe. You know, when is enough enough? You know, maybe you've experienced it with at the table, you know. You sit there at food, and you go, that's enough. When is enough enough? Have you ever realized, you know, with, like with food, there's this, I don't know, maybe I'm weird. I think about these things, but but there's this there's this um, accelerated um, or there's this rising um, satisfaction with food, and you eat, you go, wow, this is really good. Oh man, pizza, I love it. One piece, two piece, three, and then you hit a peak. When you eat piece number five and six of pizza, it doesn't taste near as good as number one and two. Have you noticed that? So why do we eat five and six? You know, so when is enough enough? Now, that's a food analogy. But how about a lot of other things in life? Clothes, size of the house, amount of luxuries, how many vacations? You know, when is enough enough? And if you're the if you're kind of person that's like, more, 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 more is better, more is better, you'll never know contentment. Learning contentment is learning that enough is enough. When is enough enough? The contented person has learned the answer to that. They've learned the answer to that. Um, when I to get married here at Grace, you have to go through premarital counseling. It's great. There's like six sessions, and we deal with a bunch of different topics, and you sign up with whatever different staff people and. And one of the sessions we always go through is on finances. And this is a speech that I always, this is what I always share with young couples. I go, now look, as you head in the area of money, one of the things in, in, the, in the syllabus we give them is um, it says, act your wage. Act your wage. All right? And this is what I explain to couples. I go, well, here's the deal. All right? Here's your income level. Yeah, well, it's not very much, Pastor Dan. We're living on love. All right, so your income level's down here. But um, so, so, you, over your lifetime, your income level will very likely fluctuate. It, it might consistently go up. It might go up, down, up, down. You might get seasick in your lifetime. But here's the trick. Here's the secret. I says, make sure your contentment level, what you're content with, the standard, your contentment level is always below your income level. If your contentment level is below your income level, you're going to be fine, man. You're going to be happier than all get out. You'll keep living on love and smiling, and there's margin in your life, and it's a wonderful thing. Up and down. If you go down, your contentment level adjusts with your income level. Up and down, whatever. I says, here's where you get in trouble. If your contentment level ever gets above your income level, you're up a crick. You're financially tanking. Learn to be content. Uh my father blessed me enormously. I still remember the conversation. I still remember where I had the conversation with him, and it was kind of in passing. I was um, heading through college and, and headed into to ministry. I, I, God, I believe God was calling me into a full-time ministry, and I was headed through college. And my father stopped me one day, and he said, Dan, your mother and I have prayed. You know, there are four kids in the family. We prayed that one of our children would go into the ministry. We, we pray that. And you were headed that direction. We were so excited. We're so proud of this. means so much to us. And my dad says, listen, son, you're gonna, I, I want to I give you a little heads up. What? You're going to have to make an adjustment in your standard of living. You're going into the ministry, and the lifestyle of which you have grown up and become accustomed, you will no longer be able to enjoy. So make the adjustment. And it was like revolutionary. But I can't tell you how it freed me. 
because there was a lifestyle adjustment when I moved out of the house and went into ministry. I didn't realize it was going to be a free fall, but it was it, it was indeed. But see, you can learn to be content. I still remember the first year I was married. I was in seminary, and um, we went to get our taxes done. And uh, the lady looked at us and said, you guys were eligible for food stamps last year. We didn't even realize it. I mean, I knew I didn't have much. I knew we ate a lot of those jiffy corn muffins and macaroni and cheese. But we were content. Secondly, contentment does not depend on circumstances. Contentment is something you learn, and you'll continue to learn. You know, in, in, in light of what I, what I just shared, you know the interesting thing? When, when, you, when, it, when we got past that first year of marriage, I get a job, you start making some more money. Guess what? I had to learn contentment all over again at different seasons and different times of life. Second, contentment does not depend on circumstances. Paul makes this point twice. It's interesting. Look at verse 11. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Now think of Paul's life. You know some of his circumstances. I read you the list. I know what it is to be in need, he says, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well-fed burp, or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So contentment does not depend on circumstances. Contentment is not tied to your circumstances. Well, I can't be content. No, contentment is not dependent on your circumstances. Theologian uh, Marislav Volf, I hope I said his name right, he, he discusses and talks about two kinds of richness in life. He talks about a richness of having and a richness of being and the difference. A richness of having is your external circumstances, what you own, what you possess. That's a richness of having. What we typically think of as rich. He's rich. She's rich. What does that mean? It's a richness of having. He said there's also a richness of being. That's the inner experience of our lives. And he says typically we focus on richness of having and we ignore and do not put that much time, energy, and attention into richness of being. We're pursuing riches of having. If only I could have a dream house. If only I could have a higher salary. If only I could have enough money to go on that vacation. If only, if only, if only. Versus the riches of being. The trouble is we will never be content if we're constantly focused on richness of having. Because contentment is not found in that direction. Jesus said this. And, w- and what I think is one of the most countercultural statements that Jesus makes. In Luke 12, verse 15, he says, Watch out and be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Jesus is saying, You want to know joy, you want to know peace, you want to content- you want to know contentment. You want to know rest. It is not found in the abundance of your stuff. It's not found in richness of having. It is found in richness of being. John Ortberg picks up on this and says this. We seek richness of having, but, we have, but what we really want is richness of being. We want to be grateful. We want to be joyful. We want to be content. We want to be free from anxiety and generous. We scramble after richness of having because we think it will produce richness of being, but it does not. This is the secret of being content. Paul talks about we have to understand these things. There are preachers out there that will tell you that it's all about richness of having. And so you tag along with God, and you say the right formulas, and claim certain things by faith, and you're going to get rich. And that's where life is really at. And God said, Jesus said, baloney. Paul told Timothy, there's guys out preaching that stuff, and tell them to be quiet because it's not true. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, he points it out, says these guys are causing all kinds of friction between people 
uh, of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means of great gain, financial gain. Okay, I show up to church, float Jesus a little money, you know, say the right formulas, and bingo, I have all the money I ever wanted because God wants me rich. And, 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 and Paul says to Timothy, that's crazy. They think that God, here's the answer, but godliness with contentment is great gain. See, a true relationship with God, you love him, he loves you, along with contentment is richness of being. There is great gain there. Psalm 36, verses 7 and 8. Would you say this person is rich? How priceless is your unfailing love, God. Both high and low among men find refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. There's a content person. Paul says, I've found that. Paul says there are resources that the contented person has learned to tap into. It is the secret of contentment. Third, and this takes us right into the third point, is this. Contentment then comes when I want, I want, we want. Don't tell yourself you don't, and it's part of the way we're created. We want, we want. And that's okay as long as you chase it to the right place. I want what God gives me. I want what I have that the sovereign God has given me. And so when you want what God gives you, you're content. That's why verse 13 is right here. You know, we often pull it out of context. This is all in the idea of contentment. And then it says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I can do everything through him. It's tied into him. I want what God gives. Now, I know football players put this under their eyes and write it on their stuff, and eh, that's fine. But, but this is really talking about the strength and the resources to be rich in being that we find when we're content in what God gives us. Uh, the, the new banners are fantastic. We're going to leave these, uh, you know, these are going to be the ones to focus in on in the coming months and, and years. But life in Christ, do you have life in Christ? We're going to continue to ask ourselves these questions. Do you have life in Christ? Are you, have you been, has he made you alive spiritually? If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. We have, there's been a, a spiritual birth in our hearts and lives when we get reconciled with the living God and are adopted into his family and we're rich. This is life in Christ. And Paul says, I have this life in Christ and have found my contentment in him. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. See, Jesus Christ came. The poverty he experienced. Was Jesus in need? Yes. Jesus had never been in need, the Son of God. And he went without. He was hungry. He went without so that you and I could be rich. So that you and I can be rich. See, the can, listen, the content person, the person who has found contentment has, has, has done something. Here's, how the, here's, how the, here's what they do. They see the gifts that they be given in life, the bounty of their possessions and the abundance. They see the gifts that they have in life and they have traced the gifts back to the giver and found what they want is in him. And their soul is finally at rest. See, it's like C.S. Lewis said. He looked at a sunbeam coming down. And he says, you can stay focused on the beam or the, or the gifts in this stage. But, but he says, you got to follow the beam back up to the source, to the sun. And, and Paul, so that's why Paul goes, you know what? It doesn't matter if, I, if I'm hungry or I'm full, I have a lot, or I have nothing. You, you, don't, you don't stay focused on the gifts of life and how all that's going. You've got to trace it back to the giver and find contentment in what he gives. 
Habakkuk talks about this. This is a verse I'm, I will continue to bring up is for as long as I get to keep preaching. <laughs> and, and the reason I keep bringing Habakkuk up, this is a sidelight. This passage in Habakkuk, I'll continue to bring it up until it's very, very familiar amongst us here at Grace. Because I don't know how much longer God will continue to bless us in, an, in insanely prosperous ways in which he has in this country. Anytime you leave the country, and I've had the privilege of leaving the country quite a bit, I come back to this country and go, you've got to be kidding. Do, we, do you understand what an incredible bubble we live in, my friends? And it might not go on forever. And if that doesn't happen, do we have to panic? You know, you can watch TV and come away panicking. Oh, no, we're up a crick. Guess what? Habakkuk chapter 3 says this. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Watch. The sovereign Lord is my strength. See, the sovereign Lord. I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. The sovereign God gives what He gives. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Somehow He found contentment in that, see? The sovereign Lord is my strength, and he makes my feet like the feet of a deer, enables me to tread on the heights. Contentment comes when I want what the sovereign God gives. The contented soul's testimony is a very familiar verse. The contented soul's testimony is this. The Lord is my shepherd. And the next phrase says, I shall not want. It's found contentment. In who? In his shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. That's where contentment is. If you can honestly from your heart say, the Lord is my shepherd. He's the sovereign God. He cares for me. And I want what he gives me. It, 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 content, that's the secret of contentment. Philip... Uh, Philip Keller wrote a book a number of years ago. Um, he had a lot of experience as a shepherd in the Middle East. And he saw how these things worked, and he wrote a book called A uh, Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. It's, it's a great book. I've heard people quote it. I've never read it. <laughs> My wife read it and said, Dan, this is phenomenal, and, and I picked up a... Here's what he says about this first phrase, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He says, you know, that's such an interesting thing as I get around people, some with tremendous means and wealth and others with nothing. And he says, when I'm around these people who have nothing, an interesting thing comes out of their lives. He said, because they belong to Christ and have recognized him as Lord and master of their lives, their owner and manager, they are permeated by a deep, quiet, settled peace that is beautiful to behold. It is indeed a delight to visit some of these humble homes where men and women are rich in spirit, generous in heart, and large of soul. They radiate a serene confidence and a quiet joy that surrounds all the tragedies of their time. They are under God's care, and they know it. They have entrusted themselves to Christ's control, and they have found contentment. The Lord is my shepherd. I, I, I shall not want. It's all good. It's all right. I want what my shepherd gives me, and it's good. And in Christ, he's given me a lot, right? If the Lord is your shepherd, if he is your Savior, shepherd, he's given you salvation, he's given you sonship, he's given you an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for us. And so what happens is the temporary movements of the stock market or the fluctuation of our particular circumstances, whether we have food or no food or in and out or whatever it is, 
It doesn't phase the person. Paul says, no, 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 I've learned to be content. It's in my shepherd, and I want what he gives me. Even though, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because he's with me. There's the secret of contentment. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, uh, says it this way. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Why? Because contentment isn't found in more, more, more there. So don't, don't, don't go there. Don't go there. And be content with what you have. Because God said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. See, here's the deal. When Jesus is all you have, you find out that Jesus is all you need. And in fact, you realize that Jesus is all your heart has ultimately longed for the whole time. Finally, uh, contentment, fourth. And this one surprised me as I was studying the passage. I'm going, what is Paul saying? Contentment, lastly, will uncomplicate your relationships. Now, if you're an English major, uncomplicate might not be right. But, you know, relationships get complicated. So this is the point I want us to see. Contentment will uncomplicate your relationships. Now, this surprised me, but I want you to think about this. I want you to think about it, and I'm going to look at what some of the things that Paul said to these people back at this church. Think about this with me. People that you know who are greedy, who are never satisfied, their lives are like more, 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 more. They're, there's no contentment in them. They're always wanting. They're always, what, what happens to those people? They move through relationships, and they're like a black hole. They're just sucking everybody, you know, because they're like, they're never content. It's always more, 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 greed, 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 and satisfied. So they go through, and they're, they're just like a black hole. And, 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 what, and so the people around them begin to treat them in a different way. Like they call, and they pick up their phone, and they say, what do they want now? Yeah. How do we relate to this? And it makes the relationship complicated. And so sometimes people say, oh, I don't want to, I'm not answering, I don't want to be around these people. Other people, it's more guarded or whatever. Well, you got to wait in, you got to set up barriers, you got to whatever, whatever. So it, 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 it complicates the relationship. And it's because they're not content. Now, Paul, Paul wanted to make sure the Philippians knew he wasn't one of those kind of guys. Over and over in the epistles, Corinthians, Thessalonians, there are a lot of different places where you will see Paul writing to these people and making it real clear to them, look, I'm not doing this for the money. I'm not into you for what you can give me. That's not the deal. See, there were a lot of preachers running around in Paul's day. They would come into town. I'll give you some spiritual things, but what's the love offering going to be? Hey, let's say any up here. And it really got weird. And so Paul would go overboard to make sure people knew, I'm not one of those kind of guys. Paul said, I would go into town and on purpose say, I'm not going to take any money from you. I'm going to work at making tents. I'm going to work long hours all night long so that there's no money exchanging here because it, it's too easy for it get to be complicated, right? So that's what Paul did many, many times. And so he's writing back. Now, with that in mind, Listen to what Paul says as he writes back to this church that's just sent him this very gracious gift. Verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but had not it had no opportunity to show it. See, there's no manipulation. Paul says, you know what? I know you care about me. You guys love me and care about me. It's, it, it just, you know, there wasn't any opportunity to tangibly express it. And now there is. I'm in jail. And you guys, are, that's so cool. I knew you cared about me. The gift didn't prove it, but the gift was a sweet thing. Now watch what he says the next. I'm not saying this because I'm in need. And then he goes into this whole thing about contentment. He said, I'm not telling you guys I really appreciated the gift 
because subtly, I'm going to send you some envelopes to make sure you keep sponsoring me every month. He says, I don't want to get this weird. He said, I'm okay. You need to know I'm all right. And then he wraps the thing up in verse 14. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. And then next week you'll see why he was excited about the reason that they gave. Because of what it meant. Here's the thing. Paul is very careful. He appreciates the gift and the exchange of gift. But he's very careful to go, now listen. I have such contentment in God. You guys need to know that. That way this whole thing stays un complicated. Isn't that a sweet thing? Isn't it? It's an amazing thing. Because think of this, folks. Think with me on this. Think of how a lack of contentment messes up relationships all the time. For example, how about in a family? It will suck the life out of your family, a lack of contentment. How? Dad's never satisfied till he buys the bigger whatever, the next toy, the next whatever. You know, or the, or the big, never satisfied. Mom's always complaining the house is outdated. The kids need, need, need. I want, want, want. This isn't good enough. I want a phone. I want this kind of phone. I want that kind of phone. I want this. And everybody's, and well, we're going to go on that vacation. Well, my friends are going here, and those guys are going over there, and she just bought this, and she just bought that. What happens to the family dynamics? People start looking at each other like, what, 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 what is this? What am I to you? Just a paycheck? Am I just bringing home the bacon? Is that all you, I am to you? You know, what, what's going on here? And then they look at each other. You know what? If you'd work harder, we'd get this. Well, if you'd get a better job, well, if you'd be smarter, well, why don't you go do this? Well, what are you doing? What are I doing? Sound familiar? And what is it? Nobody has any contentment, and that just kills the relationships. It makes them so complicated. Then you go to work. The owners aren't content, and they never have enough. So what do they do? They just they want more. They want more. They want more. The owners want a bigger piece of this, a bigger piece of that. And the employees are going, wait a second, what about ours? And, and then the employees are never happy. And the employees are comparing paychecks. And the employee, what about this? What about this? What about that? And it just makes everything really complicated to the point when the boss then comes and says... You know what? I think you're doing a tremendous job, and things are really going great around here. This is wonderful. You're wondering what's coming next. You really wonder what's coming next because you go, you know what they're really after is more out of me, so I don't know if I can trust them. It complicates everything, doesn't it? Exodus chapter 20 talks about how the opposite, you know, one of the opposites of contentment is covetousness. It's the 10th commandment. Watch how it complicates relationships with your neighbor. <laughs> Exodus 20. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Boy, if I had a woman like that. Or his manservant or maidservant. Okay, they don't have any maids, but man, their kid goes out and cuts the lawn. What the heck's my kid doing? Um, his ox or donkey. Okay, motorcycle and boat. Or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Don't cover anything that belongs to you. Why? Because what happens is contentment, what's cool is contentment will finally free you from wanting all your neighbor's stuff so that you can actually have a relationship with your neighbor and not be in competition with him or want his stuff. Contentment frees you and says, what do you want? I want what God's given me, and it's good. And if finally what it does, see, with Paul, what it did with Paul, with the Philippians, what it will do in your family, what it will do at work, and what it will do with your neighbors, contentment will free you to actually love people. It will free you to love. And this is what Paul was doing with the Philippians. Paul was content, and it freed him to actually love these people, and it freed them to love him. See? People, and I, and I say this in closing, you know, people who are content then in relationships, people who are content, they do not have to use people. They don't have to con people. They don't have to continue to evaluate a relationship to see what it's going to give to them because they, they have been given everything. In Christ. They've been given it all. 
And so they're at rest. They're at peace. I, I, I've learned to be content. And what that does is free them, finally, to love other people. See, when all you really want is what the sovereign God chooses to give you, then you know the richness of being and the satisfaction of contentment, and it will free you to love. That's pretty powerful stuff, Paul, from prison. A lot to think about. Father, I pray that you would, you would transform our hearts and minds through what you are communicating to us in your word. We desperately need this. We're Americans. We live in incredible prosperity, and we still don't know contentment. We, we want to learn this. We want you to teach it to us. And um, thank you for what we enjoy when we taste it and the abundance of your delights. It lights us up, and uh, we're glad. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.